seems like an uh, appropriate time to, to dive in, everyone. Uh, once again, absolute pleasure uh, to roll into our fourth week of the, uh, of the series. Uh, I think what we've learned so far, far in, in running these uh, from a panel perspective is we're really going to try and give you some actionable takeaways. Uh, for me, uh, previous guests that have, have stood out in delivering some really impactful content uh, were talking about unique approaches uh, that have really made them stand out from the crowd when, uh, when prospecting. Uh, from an audience perspective, we can keep this moving on the topics that you really care about if you can ping some questions on the, on the chat. And please make sure that you do that to the panelists and everyone else, uh, because we've found that that stirs up a little bit of conversation and debate, which is, uh, is certainly good for us to feed off. The headline topic today is around closing uh, on sales development uh, and outbound prospecting activity, and also maximizing the value of all of your interactions. So I would ask if you can relate your questions to those subjects, it will really help for us to focus the, focus the conversation. Uh, I'll be hosting today and throughout we'll be trying to relay some of the know-how uh, Engage Tech brings to the table around, uh, around appointment setting. Uh, for some context, our agents are making uh, uh, around 100 outbound attempts daily and, and are constantly looking to generate urgency and commit prospects to, to actually giving up time uh, for a meeting. Um, and we're firmly of the view there are opportunities out there right now for you to be starting meaningful conversations because we're witnessing it firsthand. Uh, but we wanted to uh, share some of our insider knowledge with uh, other, uh, other experts in the industry seeing success right now. Uh, so firstly, I just wanted to introduce uh, Tony Morris. Uh, he's the creator of uh, Killer Sales. Uh, he's a sales speaker, uh, trainer, and also author. Uh, Tony, uh, you told me that there are some people that you've spoken to in the recent past who are uh, kind of asking the question, is it actually possible to, to sell and prospect in the, in the current climate? I yeah. would love to hear your input on that. No, absolutely. Well, thank you, Callum, for having me. And thank you guys for, for investing your time. Um, people are buying. That was the first thing. Yes, this, this is temporary. There is a change, but people are buying. But I think what's very important, you know, a lot of my clients have said to me, they are scared of selling right now. And it's a really interesting point. And I, I, I actually solely believe we don't sell. I don't sell training or speaking engagements. I help my clients buy. And that's a big difference. So if you think about whatever product service you're in, what are you actually doing? You're solving your customers' pain points. You're solving their needs or you're helping them, uh, you're helping them achieve aspirations they want to realize their potential. So you're not selling anything. And, and, and it, I'll be honest with you, five weeks ago when this crisis began, I started to doubt and think, you know, I'm scared how I'll come across to my clients. And I had to very quickly shut myself up and realize that I help my clients motivate their salespeople, get, have better conversations, which lead to better results. So therefore, I'm not selling anything. I am helping them achieve their goals. So I think the, the really important message I want to get across, guys, if you're sitting there thinking you're nervous about trying to sell right now is remember how you add value to your clients and prospects. What problems are you solving for them or what goals are you helping them realize from the products and services you offer? And when you have that mind shift change, you'll realize you're not selling actually anything. You're simply serving, you're helping. Um, and uh, you know, just to give you a bit of a context with myself, I've, I've helped now just over 30,000 salespeople all around the world. I've, I've been very lucky to speak in 25 countries at sales conferences. As Callum said, I'm an author of five books on sales and my best-selling book, Coffees for Closers. Um, and I, I'm about to launch this week TMI Sales University, which is my sales membership platform where I can help thousands of salespeople develop themselves, learn and grow so that they can really catapult their, their figures and their sales performance now and when we're out of this crisis. So the, the big message take I want you to think is you're not selling anything right now. You're helping your customers solve their problems and realize their aspirations, not selling. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I suppose just for some, uh, uh, just an additional bit of input there. Um, we are uh, privileged to have uh, three guests on today who are more than happy to share some free content. Um, one is uh, uh, Tony's ebook, um, and uh, as the other guests introduce himself, we'll, we'll cover this. But Freddie's going to publish the uh, email addresses for the panel, 
Uh, and um, if you want to email direct, then um, Tony will be happy to share his uh, uh, his ebook. Um, and yeah, JK JK Rowling, better watch out. You're hot, hot on her tail. Five uh, five five books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't make as many sales just yet. <laughs> you know, close. I'm on the I'm on the journey, right? Sure. <laughs> um, next up, uh, we've got Natasha Evans. Uh, she's a customer success manager at Sales Loft. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Sales Loft are a market leading sales engagement provider. Uh, uh, Natasha, I'd imagine that you're speaking to a lot of companies right now about how to maximise uh, the value that Sales Loft is is uh, uh, is or could offer for their, for their business. You're very much an ear to the ground with those teams, I'd imagine, in your, in your current role. Um, what's the kind of value that the solution is adding and, and, and what have you seen as kind of common trends in the, uh, in, in the last few weeks? Yeah, um, and so to, to echo what Tony said, really excited to be here and, and to speak to everyone. I think if I'm to think about the, the value that we're talking to right now, it falls into three different areas. The first one is, as an SDR or a BDR, it's that ability to pivot and change your strategy really quickly to suit the current climate. Things like personalizing a lot more, being more authentic while still maintaining the scale that you need to obviously keep as an SDR or a BDR. If you happen to lead an SD team, it's things like making sure you know how your team are getting on. How do you measure performance remotely? How do you coach remotely? And just making sure that people really know how to leverage sales loft for that. And then I think from a, a company perspective, we know that you guys need to be the best you possibly can be right now. And so we're thinking of a few things that we can do to really help you. And so we've really ramped up our online training to make sure that we're helping SDRs and BDRs really maximize what they're doing, think about their strategy and how they might need to change it. But we're also publishing a ton of great content and data around how has the world changed? What is working right now as we're seeing it through the Salesloft platform? And so I know you mentioned um, obviously access to content. You guys are more than welcome to reach out to me to get some of that data. I can share any of it today if you're interested, but you can also get all of that on the Sales Loft blog as well. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, I've actually been uh, subject to a, a little bit of a, a ribbing in our business uh, because we have a, an, an orange branding uh, for our company. And you see this over there, there's my kitchen actually uh, represents the uh, Engage Tech brand. But Mark has completely uh, overruled that today uh, with a, an amazingly themed uh, shirt and room combo. Uh, we've uh, got Mark Savinson, he's CEO of Strategy to Revenue. Uh, they support the likes of DHL, Motorola, and also Thomson Reuters and improving sales team performance. Mark, I'm excited to, uh, to hear the answer to this one. How many cold calls have you received in the last month? And has anyone been successful in tying you down to actually have a conversation? Okay, so, so truth is too many. Um, and most of them fail for three reasons. And it ties to what Tony and Natasha have said, that they come over as they don't know who I am, what I do, too formulaic, not really interested in me. And when I ask them a question, they can't answer it. So waste of time. Why are we seeing people do it? Because quite rightly, and let's, let's be clear, everybody is answering the phone more than they used to. Because hey, they got there are no gatekeepers out there. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not in the office. Um, I'm more willing to answer the phone. There are some people who will talk to us, you know, and will talk to you. But that's because they haven't spoken to anyone for a day. So a voice is better than no voice. But if we are going to sell, and I again I re-emphasize what Tony and Natasha said, you know, we are selling because we are helping. You've got to be relevant. And what we're spending our life as a business, and we use various phrases with our clients, a couple, and they're not original to us. Uh, one, walk in the buyer's shoes. Think them, not you. Two, make the customer the hero of their story. It's about them, it's not about you. And if you think about what the buyer is confronted with, they are scared. You know, they are having new problems to solve. Can you help them? And whilst you may not be able to close quickly, and we've just spent some time with a client who's saying, I can't persuade my customer to close. And we're going, well, of course you can't because they're in EBIT protection mode. You know, your decision maker no longer can make a decision. Don't worry about it. They will come out the other side. You nurture, you help. When they're ready to buy, you've got to be there, but you can't force them. Um, <clears throat> So as an organization, we're all about trying to make salespeople more productive. 
and, and we're also trying to be slightly controversial. So the other thought that I will give you, we've all said be customer centric. You will all at some point have gone on a sales methodology course. Sales methodologies are great. A buyer doesn't care. How do I know? I've never seen a buyer say, I will only buy from you if you use Taz, Spin, Challenger. They say, help me. So think about them, put them at the center and everything we're talking about. You do that, you can sell through this. One of the points I really like about what you raised there, Mark, was about putting yourself in the, in the customer's shoes because we had a conversation with uh, our new business team this week at Engage Tech. And the, uh, the challenge that I put to them was, how would you feel about convincing our owner to part ways with, say, uh, I don't know, 10 to 15 grand right now to spend on a particular, um, uh, and a, a, any, any service, any, any offering? How, would, how confident would you feel about convincing him to, to part with that money? Uh, and I, I definitely saw a dynamic change off the back of that thought process, which is there's, it's so important to put yourself in the position that it's difficult to convince people to part with money right now for you as a salesperson, but also for the champion in that business. And the more you can help them to, um, to come around to that. Yeah, and if you just think about, and everybody think about what drives us to make a decision, three, three things drive us to make a decision. One is fear, fear of I've got something, I'm going to lose it. At the moment, and if you go and talk to any behavioral psychologist, um, the technical term is we're all shit scared. Okay, Our whole world has been challenged. So the reason we're not spending any money is we're scared of losing things. So what's the easiest way? Hold on to what i got. So my first thing I've got to go and explain to people, actually, by you doing nothing, you're going to be worse off. So again, that's why people like us are all going around to organizations to say, you've got to keep selling. Because if you stop, and I saw a great blog from somebody which said, if you don't make any phone calls, you don't build a pipeline. If you don't build a pipeline, you don't sell anything next quarter. Go figure. So we have to be talking to people. It's very straightforward. Second one is opportunity. Can I give you something you didn't have? And that's harder to do because you didn't have it in the first place. Therefore, you not having it may not be as great. And the third one um, is herd mentality or fear of missing out. And again, we're seeing a lot because of social media of herd mentality going on. If everybody says I'm scared of spending, guess what? Everybody's scared of spending. You're seeing the reverse of that as well. You know, people like yourself, Callum, are putting out lots of posts saying more people are answering phones than ever before. And we're already seeing a trend when more and more people are saying, you know what? Let's pick up the phone. We thought that was old hat. We wanted to do social selling. And all of a sudden we've discovered, no, people will talk. Let's pick up a phone. So look for the three, risk, opportunity, and, and FOMO. And then there your opportunities lie. Can I add one thing to that? I think that's absolutely spot on. And, and I'm a massive believer, like Mark said, about see the world through your customer's eyes. So I, I study NLP, which I'm sure a lot of you guys will be familiar. And they, they say in NLP that if you see the world through John Smith's eyes, you are more likely to get John Smith to buy from you. It's about that empathy position. And in fact, let me demonstrate, if I may, a great way to do this, a great technique. And guys, I want Callum, Mark, Natasha, you to do the same, as well as you watching this. So with your right hand, guys, make the shape of a gun with your right hand. All of you. Have to put it and in you at home, take the gun. <laughs> Turn that, that's a cool gun, Mark. You've done that before. <laughs> Turn that into a circle. Perfect. Just place that on your chin. On your is chin that or your, your cheek? Chin? Cheek. <laughs> now you three got it, but I reckon some of the listeners probably didn't, and they're sitting there like, done. I've been done. <laughs> Why? Because we remember at school, Simon says, right, naturally you match what you see and you match what you hear. So when you are selling, and, and I, again, I don't like the word, it is helping, but when you are helping, are you matching your prospect's language? Do you pick up on the words they use? Because if you do, it will resonate with them. Are you matching their tone, their pace, their volume? Not their accent, that's called racist. I wouldn't be matching that. But match other areas because now you see things how they do, which will naturally make them more comfortable. And then going back to Mark's brilliant point about herd mentality, if you can tie that in with a success story, 
where the client was the hero and how you help so another client solve their pain that they're experiencing. That's the way to persuade right now. Thanks, Tony. Pleasure. Uh, just wanted to roll into some of the, uh, some of the questions uh, that, we, that we had prepared. I think um, I'd, I'd like to start with you on, on, on this one, Natasha. Uh, does the phrase always be closing encourage the right or wrong behaviours in, in your view? Um, I think, look, I think always be closing is, is absolutely fine. I would say that right now, personally, we have changed tact a little bit in sales loft from always be closing to always be helping. And I know we're reiterating stuff that's been said already, but we're recognizing that our prospects, our customers, they just want something a little bit different right now. And so are most of the customers that I'm working with, to be honest. So I'm not going to say that always be closing encourages the, the wrong mentality because I don't agree with that at all. I just think that right now we need to take a slightly different approach and make sure that we're helping before we get to that close. Now, these guys have talked about it already, but if you want to close and you want to close well, you need to make sure that you're solving a pain point. And as long as you're confident that you're solving a pain that they have, then closing is fine and it's natural because you know that the customer or the prospect wants it and that they need it. May I add to that? That's a really good point, Natasha. I do believe in ABC, but, and, and I'll be honest with you, this isn't my content. This is, I, I, I have a podcast called Confessions of a Serial Seller where I've had the, the wonderful Mark turned up in a different shirt, but also quite alarming to the eye. <laughs> and, um, and, and I've had some of the best salespeople like Jeb Blunt, Jeffrey Gittimer come on the podcast. And one of them shared this. They said, ABC, ABC should be always be curious. I and, and I think what really separates the top salespeople are ones who are genuinely interested. And like Mark said, he's had thousands of calls that most 99% are dreadful because they've not done their homework. They don't add any value and they can't answer questions and they're not interested or they don't even fake it. So I think the ABC really actually is always be curious, which will get that prospect more engaged, which will enable you to win their business. Can I add something there? Just one final yeah, little sure. comment. I think we've talked a little bit about um, call volumes going up, but people not necessarily being relevant or adding enough value. I think it's because the current climate and coronavirus COVID as a talking point is an easy fallback where people aren't necessarily sure what they should be actually asking, how they should be pitching. And so it's easy to just talk about coronavirus how are you feeling how's the climate and so i think if you want to really like ace it in today's market it's okay yes we acknowledge that but it's going one level further how can you add value on top of that or how can you solve a pain on top of that particular talking point sure. so can i just just think of it this way everything they've said is correct always be progressing go forward at the end of every conversation have we moved forward have i shared an insight that makes them think oh that's different and we look at it um and, and this shouldn't be a competition of who's got some, the best phrases but we, we use four four phrases when we look at how people buy they go through four simple processes why change why should i actually do something once they've worked out why to change what do i change to so you've identified a problem what might a solution look like remember you're thinking like a buyer not a seller so what would the solution look like then change to who, who would I get it from? And then commit to change. Okay, I'll do it. And that's what we've got to do. My closing stages are moving them from why change to change to what, to move them from change to what, to change to who, to move them from change to who, to commit to change, and then I get an order. And as Natasha quite rightly said, good closing happens. It's not a forced close. And especially if you're biocentric, it's the buyer who closes, it's not you. You don't force them to sign, unless we use that gun that Tony suggested we all get on. <laughs> so you guys have uh, pretty much been in agreement, um, and I think uh, uh, for yourself, Mark, you've probably been the most vocal about the need for there to be a, a relevant approach uh, for someone to, uh, as an example, engage with you. You're in a, you're in a role at sea level, so there will be people on this call who are trying to prospect into, in, into your equivalent in other businesses. I would imagine that a lot of the people on this call are expected to or are trying to outbound at scale. 
you know, uh, perhaps 50 plus attempts on a daily basis at, at a minimum. So how would you uh, translate a, a, a requirement to, uh, to, to prospect at scale to, to actually give yourself an opportunity of enough conversations, given it might take 20 attempts to get a prospect on the phone and actually making those uh, calls relevant once they get through? Like, What's the balancing act? How does someone do that? Okay, so I mean, I'll tell you what we're doing um, when we're trying to sell, which is we're really clear what we want our, you know, our, our um, voice campaign to achieve. What are we selling? And in our case, we're selling the next meeting. That's all. I'm not looking beyond that. Sell the next meeting. Because I know I don't have long on the phone. So come up with a message that's all about, we recognize you've got this potential issue. We think we have a solution. Can't discuss it now. Can I discuss it later? Will you book some time for me? Next. Because actually, I can't discuss it now. <laughs> and whether I'm at a sea level or lower down, no one's going to have thought about it properly. So be clear what it is you're selling. And in our case, when we're doing this at scale, we are selling the meeting. That's it. Really clear. I'm going to add, I'm going to, add to that. I love that term voice campaign. That's very, I've never heard that. I love that. Um, I believe the research should be done before call time because what I've noticed again with top sales producers is they, they don't have more hours than all of us. They just use their time wiser. Um, and therefore the research of who you, you should be reaching out to should have already been done. You know, my, my clients will be doing that at pre seven thirty in the morning. They'll do it over lunch or in an evening when they can have a nice gin and tonic and relax and do their homework. And, and to make it simple, I would suggest, depends on what product service you offer and who your target audience is, focus, let's, I work in 62 industries. So when I do my prospecting, I focus on one industry per day. And I've already got my hit list ready. I know who I'm reaching out to. I've got their contact details from homework I've done. And I've already got my success story ready. Because like Mark said, you've got to have a clear outcome. And I call it the gap. You know, I, I always say you need a goal for every call. And the, the late Richard Denny said, if you don't have a goal, you can't score. So normally in my, my world, my goal is to book an appointment like Mark. But how do I get that quickly? I don't talk about what I do. I talk about what I've done successfully with people like them. So I've already got my success story ready to articulate in the first 20 seconds of the call. And it's going to be the same success story because I'm phoning the same sort of people who either have the same pain points, same aspirations, or they're in a similar size organization or industry. So I can keep repeating the same elevator pitch during my day. Yep. So that would be my best advice. I think one of the additional things for me on that uh, and I, I, I uh, it's a broad brush statement, but I've seen it with a lot of, uh, a lot of salespeople. Uh, we aren't the best at updating CRMs, taking notes, jotting things down. Uh, and one way that you can really um, help your prospecting is by only doing that research uh, and that preparation once. And most of you will have a CRM setup, which allows for you to document what uh, that prep actually actually looks like and um, and particularly in a, in a in a business where we do a lot of outbound i've found that the people who are good at um maximizing that prep time and replicating it and, and putting it in our crm really shortcut having to uh, prepare 20 times before they get that prospect on on the, on just, the phone just to interact because we spend our lives talking about productivity you know you have so many hours in the day how do you use it in the most productive way and that is where you use your tool so you know um, I don't get commission here. Will you sales loft? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because of it simplifies the process. But but I use the term very deliberately voice campaign. So there's a campaign starting on Thursday. And guys, you'll be doing something similar. We've got a thousand names we're targeting. We have a process where someone actually does a pre-dial and then passes it through to the salesperson just because we don't want to be sitting there wasting our time dialing. But we know what industry we're talking to and we're only talking to three personas in that industry once that so it really is we've done our research once we sound credible enough to sell the meeting not to go into too much detail but we make it easy and there, there will be a group of people just hammering their way through the calls and using sales loft to make sure we do the follow-up immediately not oh, i've got to do it you know so the whole point is and again you know we we 
done all our preparation. So we have a number of emails. Thank you for the meeting. Sorry you couldn't agree a date, but you know, I'm gonna go and follow you up. And you didn't find it of interest, but I'm gonna put you in nurture and share an insight. And they go out immediately. So we process it, you know, and again, that's what we do with our clients. When we sit with a client, we say, you've only got so many hours in a day and you don't wanna waste those hours. And as a buyer, I don't wanna have a phone call with someone and then get the meeting invite three days later. So sure. you've got to think about that through. Can I add a recommendation here? Sorry, Callum, to, to interject. Just to kind of piggyback off what's been talked about around doing your research up front. I think my, <clears throat> my smartest customers, the way that they do this is they'll try and find more than one thing in that first piece of research. I think if you're, if you're in sales dev or, or BDR, it's hard if you only find one piece of um, content that you can use to personalize because you find yourself then struggling for what to say further on in your sales process. So the next time you email <clears throat> or the next time you have a social touch, like, what do I say now? I've already used that one piece. I think if you really want to, again, stand out from the crowd, you have more than one thing that you can use to personalize that approach throughout that sales process, not just on that first touch point. Yeah. I, th I think one of the things that all three of you have touched on and used the words, uh, this word multiple time is, is preparation. And like the thing I can't stress enough to people that are, that are on this call is this is not luck. You are not, people don't, good salespeople don't just turn up to work and the results just fall in their lap for the 50 years that they're in the job. Uh, they are working hard to prepare uh, and to make sure that they uh, start to control the outcomes on a daily basis. One challenge I would put to you is, in the current climate, there aren't distractions. If you're not preparing now day to day, how can you expect to actually do that when you go back to a, a, a society when you can make a choice to go out and to do this and, and, and to do that? And this is the time I would say to build that skill if you don't have it right now, because uh, you're going to find it difficult uh, um, once, we, once we go back to, to normality. There isn't really an excuse right now not to, not to be doing it. Um, I just want to move on to uh, to, to next uh, next question. Um, how and when should people be closing on sales development calls? Uh, Tony, maybe you, you could you could take that. So when, when's your moment where you uh, where you'd suddenly look to, to to actually say to someone, "Let's have a meeting and let's go to that next stage." Uh, I, I think, look, we've got to be listening out for buying signals, right? To to and and that's a good parameter to know. Now's the time to ask for commitment. But I think Mark touched on this before is we shouldn't be closing. The buyers should be closing themselves. And, and the only way that's ever going to happen is if we've identified the problem enough and given an idea and a solution to fix their problem. And when those two things marry up, it will naturally close itself. And, and sometimes the prospect might just need that tiny little gentle help where we'll say something like, are you comfortable with that? Or what date would you like to start this price? So it's a very gentle, gentle approach. But I, I think salespeople get so scared, I don't know if scared is the right word, but maybe it is, of closing or asking for that business. And I think the reason they are so worried about it is they've not done all the hard work before. And I, I really believe that, that if you've done your prep effectively, you've identified their challenge, their problem, their pain, you've given them a credible solution that can help them, you've backed it up with success stories, you've shared great insight, like Natasha said, more than one, then it will naturally come to that close. Um, and the only time if they need, if there's any delay on that, then obviously you're going to be doing your follow-up and using whether it's Sales Loft or our other platforms that you use so that you don't have to rely on your own memory and you can use the tech available to you but but i yeah as i said i, I really believe if the pre bit's done well it will naturally come to close to fruition as long as you're following up at the right times one thing on that is the phrase that you've used like like a credible solution uh, and it's so important for for people when they're doing sales development calls to it sounds basic, but just to believe that their solution is actually credible and believe that it, it, it can help uh, uh, right now. And, and, and it feels like from what you're saying that um, if it's qualifying a pain is really important in that, in, in that process to make the close seem a lot more sensible. Mark, it seemed like you wanted to... Yeah, I just in. want to say that there's always a danger, and we, and we all do this, you know, 
selling is not a, a one hit wonder. You don't do all of this in one call. You know, hi, I've never spoken to you before. Do you want to place an order now? It's not going to happen. Well, rephrase that. If you get a warm lead that basically someone filled in the form that said, hey, I want to place an order, you know, then the last thing you do is give them reasons not to take the order. But so when we're talking about closing, I think we all have to be clear in our mind, what do we mean? What are we closing? Every meeting, every call has a clear objection. That's what I'm closing towards, moving on through the process. Yeah. And, you know, what we're all saying, and I think, you know, if you listen to, and I'm a great believer, everybody, whenever you worry about how do I sell, take a step back and go, how do I buy? Look at how you react when you walk in. I walk into clothing stores, surprisingly. <laughs> um, you know, so what's the process I go through? How does somebody close me on a shirt? Because trust me, they don't have a conversation which goes along the lines of, so sir wants a ordinary looking shirt. You know, it's more, you want what? No, no, that's the lady section. So, <laughs> you know, you've got to understand what's going on in the buyer's mind. I know where I've got to get you. They will give you all the hints. All I'm going to do is validate, play back. So you said that this was really important to you. You said that you needed to move forward. So how do we move forward? Be really clear what you're trying to go. They will give you all the hints. If you're not getting the hints, that's probably telling you they see no value in the conversation. So that's the closing really is point. straightforward if you listen, you know, and that's what we're all bad at because when we worry, I've got to close this, you know, I've done work with clients. I'm sure you've all experienced this. You've only got two minutes for a call. <gasps> I'm coming to the end of my call. Um, 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 you know, and the customer's going, well, oh, hold on a minute. <laughs> I was just in mid flow. So Can listen. I add one thing to that? If, if I may, I was really good. I, I was coaching a financial advisor firm yesterday who have 150 expert financial advisors all around the country. And, and these guys I was training, they're call handlers. So they take an initial inquiry and their goal is to book an appointment with an advisor. And that was their challenge is, Tony, how do I close the appointment? And I changed their mindset by saying, Look at your job as a matchmaker. Imagine you're in the dating world. Your job is to speak to someone, understand what they look for from a date, their ideal potential partner, and then you're matching them up with one of the 150 advisors. So at the end of the call, it should go, well, Callum, what you've told me, I would recommend you meet with Sarah. I believe she'll be the best fit for you. And this is why. Leave it to me. I'm going to organise for Sarah to get in touch with you, looking at her diary, A or B. And so, and that was a bit of a light bulb moment for them to understand they're not closing, they're matching. They're understanding a problem and they're coming up with the idea to help them. And I think that's such an important point. It was a real light bulb for them. And they feel so relaxed now about closing an appointment. They're not closing, they're just matching to the right advisor based on their financial issues, challenges, or situation. Sure. So the headspace that you're in about that request can really dictate uh, how successful you are, you are or not when you actually, actually make it. A request mm. for a meeting is actually a, a really uh, reasonable, uh, um, uh, reasonable thing to make. It's, it's just a very common way that people will start a business engagement. Uh, and if it's off the back of a productive, you know, three, four, five minute conversation with someone, don't be afraid to jump in and have it. Absolutely. But ultimately, to me, it depends what you're getting, what you're selling. But the, the giving the client or the prospective client an opportunity to meet is part of the journey. You know, I need the meeting in order to help you understand how my solution will help you solve your problems. That's the whole purpose. So it's all part of the process. Therefore, if I'm not offering that, I'm doing you a disservice. And my job is to articulate in that meeting, whether it's Zoom or whatever platform you're going to use, of how my solution will best help you and how it will best serve you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Natasha, I wanted to get onto a, uh, a topic around um, for anyone who does feel nerves when it comes to, to closing, whether that's for an appointment on initial call or maybe at a later stage in the, in the process. Mm. Have have you, I mean, I remember, I, I remember being nervous about that when I first, when I first started out, like for you, have you experienced uh, other people in that uh, kind of headspace or yourself and any advice on, uh, on, on how to, to get past it? 
Yeah, definitely. I think there's, there's probably a lot of people out there feeling nervous about it right now and even feeling more so, more so nervous than ever because you know, you're, you're home, you're on your own, you aren't, you aren't in a busy uh, sales floor with all of your colleagues around you egging you on. And so, you know, you mentioned earlier, Callum, if you haven't got the time right now to be doing preparation, you're missing out. I'd say the same thing about learning and improving your game. Now more than ever, you should have more time to be thinking about how can I improve? How can I boost my confidence? And there's a couple of ways that I would do that. One thing is everybody's on the call already today. So you've taken the first step into thinking about how can I up my game? The other thing is listening into what your colleagues are doing. So listen into their recordings, listen to what they're saying, how they're closing and see how you might want to take tips from them, but also listen to your own calls, look at your own stats and think about, okay, what's working really well for me right now and what do I need to change and be improving? And I think pretty soon you'll up your confidence just like thinking about what you can be doing better and trying new things. Uh, and I think that'll definitely help. And I've just had a couple of really simple techniques, which are going to sound really simple, but really help everybody because we're all scared. And if you're not scared, there's something wrong with you, by the way, that probably means you're not really thinking about it. So, so what do you do? One, you visualize. So you take that deep intake of breath and visualize the flow of the call. You know, the, the, the great quote from Usain Bolt, you know, you, know, when, you know, how does he win a race? He says, I'll win the race before I start. He visualizes his 9.6 seconds of running before he started. He knows exactly what he's going to do. Do the same thing. Visualize the call. And that deep intake of breath before you make the call, so you center yourself, and then, you know, the other one is smile. Absolutely. If you Can smile, I have... you feel better. Um, and, you know, it comes over. It, I mean, it's better now. We can see each other. But half of it, you know, you can't see. And I, I can hear the... Um, <laughs> uh, you, know, you can't do that if you sit up straight and you smile. Stand up, whatever it takes. But don't be scared about being scared. It's, you know, I've, I go to lots of meetings. I run the odd workshop when they allow me out. Um, but, you know, I'd be lying if I wasn't nervous at the start because you have to be. It's what focuses the mind. So use it in a positive way. Love that. I want to add a couple of points. I now know why I don't run the 100 metres in 9.6 seconds then. I've, I've not been visual. <laughs> That's why it takes me three minutes. Um, I want to pick up two brilliant points that Tasha also made. So I, I massively agree about you know, monitor your own calls. And the coaching sort of toolbox that I do with my clients is called PIM Feedback. Positive Improvement Miss. So whenever I listen to my own calls or my clients... I get them to break the call down in what positive things did I do? What things did I say that could be improved? Or what things did I miss from the call? And I think it's quite a nice way to really constructively critique a call. The second thing um, Tasha said, brilliant, about learn, develop yourself. And what I do for my own development, and I always do this, is I, I book an hour appointment with myself daily. And I either listen to a podcast, watch, read a great book, you know, at the moment, one of my favourites, I'm reading Fanatical Prospect in Jeb Blunt. It's just unreal. And I thought you were going to grab one of your own ones in. Yeah. yeah I did that again. Yeah. Mine's rubbish compared to Jeb's. But, um, <laughs> but I, I've created a sales Bible. And what I do is anything I learn goes in my Bible. And I've used my iPhone notes app. So any technique I learn, any question, any anything goes in the bible because you know it's like guys you'll read something that's brilliant and then 20 minutes later you've forgotten it I, I know i'm guilty of that so i just anything that really resonates with me that i think is going to serve me well for the future i make a note in this sales bible and i can relate to that in the future just to keep recapping what i've taken away Yes, thanks all, uh, um, all, all, all really valuable points. I think one of the, the things I liked about what Natasha said was just about listening to colleagues and, and, their, and their calls and, and how they prospect. Um, I've, I've always been of the view uh, that our uh, education system uh, in terms of school and then university after that, like you will always be told, don't plagiarize, don't copy. Uh, and it kind of like blocks collaboration in, 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 in some way or another. And it's just the surefire way to become the best person or salesperson at your company is 
sit next to the person hitting the highest numbers right now, copy everything they do, uh, and then add your own uh, uh, kind of sprinkle your own bits on top and, and, and you're going to get there. And that's maybe become a little bit tougher, uh, given that we don't see each other on a, on a day to day basis. Can, um, can I challenge you a little bit on that? Yeah, go on. on the basis of a lot of the work that we do, um, some of the highest performers are unconsciously competent at certain things yeah. that you may never be able to replicate. Um, and you can drive yourself insane trying to replicate that person because they make a leap and you go, I have no idea how they got from A to B, <laughs> but they did it in one go. And then they go, how did you do that? And they go, well, it's, it's obvious. And you go, no, it isn't. So be aware of that. You know, okay. so, some of the highest performers are just unique. Yeah, and then some of the people may on the call may have those maverick tendencies and they're fantastic. But what you've got to look for are the replicable tendencies, the things that I can learn from. And again, part of the coaching and, and using lots of different tools to find out what are the things that we do that generate the greatest results and learn from those and replicate those. Don't necessarily look at those. You know, I'm not going to go out there and say, if you want to be memorable, wear loud shirts. You know, so if anyone's interested, I don't believe anything clashes. So, you know, from my perspective, <laughs> anything goes. That's not necessarily going to work for you all. You, you didn't need to tell us. You didn't need to tell us. That. <laughs> no, <that was> <laughs> um, I, I think also just one of the other things, if anyone is a little bit nervous about closing, particularly on sales development calls, um, one thing that I've found to really help uh, people that are nervous about it is just to drop it in uh, quite softly into one of the early kind of sentences that you um, uh, that you communicate after like uh, a relevant intro or, or something just to, to pique someone's interest so the phone doesn't go down. If you can just drop into the sentence, I was just calling today because I was um, I was looking to schedule an appointment with you uh, and then roll into what you want to say after that. Um, it's it's a really soft way to broach that topic. And then when you come to it later on in the call, uh, it doesn't really feel like such a big deal because you've already um, you've already kind of managed expectations at the um, at the start. And that can happen within about the first 20 seconds. So um, I've certainly um, certainly seen that uh, help people. Um, just on to some, uh, some different topics. Uh, how, how can people prospect into their existing network to accelerate results right now? To me, it's yeah, go referral, gen referral generation is so key right now. Uh, as, as one of you said earlier, Mark, that we, we've, our contact rate uh, right now is through the roof, right? Everyone's at home. There's no gatekeepers. So w one thing that I'm advising my clients and I'm doing myself is getting hold of a client, um, getting feedback from them first. So I do two things. I say to them, you know, I'm always looking to learn, grow and develop as a business. What, why did you choose me in the first place, my company? So I get that feedback and hopefully obviously it's positive. And then I, I say, what one thing could I do even better, which is really useful feedback. I get that great feedback. I say, can I ask a small favor? And they go, and everyone says yes to that, right? It's just the way we're programmed. And you say, who do you know? One person a bit like you, that you feel could really benefit from how I've helped your business. And, and, and we all know guys, referrals in terms of the conversion from a, 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 warm, a warm lead or a cold lead to a referred lead, it's about five times higher because trust has already been built. Your clients endorsed you. So I would really be recommending reaching out to your clients, testimonials and reviews from them, but also tapping into their great connections that you can then be helping. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, 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 I absolutely did. I think one of the things I like about it is, um, and I wouldn't have necessarily expected anything different with respect to how you've uh, positioned, how you approach other topics, but mm -hmm. you are um, like kind of ruthless in your pursuit of them. And, and um, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's nothing to be shameful about, you know, you, you, you've struck, struck up a relationship and, and it's perfectly reasonable to ask for, um, uh, for a nudge in the right direction. And, uh, you know, there are salespeople that you could probably interact with who will understand the value of a referral. So they're probably a lot more likely to actually um, actually support you on in that. Natasha, do you have anything to uh, add on the on the topic? I think um, two things that come to mind for me. The first thing, I'm from like a social network background, so I think of maybe a network a little bit differently to to the average person. But 
I always think that when it comes to a network, you, you have to really build trust with that network before you go ahead and you ask for a ton of stuff. So you want to think about if you're a salesperson and you're thinking about who sits in your network, who do you want to keep touch points with? You want to think smartly about how do I add value? How do I stay top of mind with this network? Obviously in a scalable way so that then when I do want to ask of something, it's not coming out of the blue. It doesn't feel cold and it doesn't feel like I'm only asking and, and never giving. So that would be maybe one thing I would think of. I read a really good article recently that was about um, deposits and withdrawals, making sure that when it comes to asking for something that you've given enough in advance to warrant taking a withdrawal and you're not just that person that's always asking and never giving. And so that's the way that I like to think about my network and then eventually asking something of them it's a really good point actually I, I, i've now come across very selfish and revolting so thank you <laughs> she's actually she's spot on you know the, the famous zig ziglar said you can have anything in life you want if you help others get what they want first right and one thing that i do with my again coach is say to your clients if you know who's your champagne referral if i can introduce you to anyone who would that look like and, and then I like to go out and try and either introduce them or hopefully one of my connections knows them. And the truth is, once you've done that, Tasha's so right, they are actually indebted to you. So when they phone you and thank you and say, you know, I've just done a, a hundred grand piece of business on the back of that, you go, look, my pleasure, I'm delighted. May I ask a small favour of you? And then you go into the ruthless <laughs> self <laughs> yeah, I, I, the, 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 the thing about what you said, though, Tony, is for me, it should provide an anchor for everyone on the call who's nervous of doing that. You know, you're perhaps at an extreme, but you're using it to, to, to effect. And that should make everyone else feel like even if they go 50 percent in that direction, it's perfectly reasonable for, um, for that to happen. And I, th I think one of the things uh, that you touched on there as well, Natasha, is like your network needs to always be warm. It's not mm. it's like a pipeline of sorts. You know, you, you need to be interacting with people. Um, things like LinkedIn make that really easy now. You can just drop a DM once in a while. Um, and it's a, I think it's a route to people, maybe we're not, maybe always when they're not in their work mindset, you know, someone might read a LinkedIn message in a more relaxed frame of mind on the weekend, something like that. And um, it's something that you should be nurturing at, um, at, at all times. Mark, I doubt you don't have an opinion on this. So. But what the guys have said is right. You used a phrase that I, we use a lot, which is nurture you know, recognize that you've got to nurture the relationship. You've got to, and as Natasha Kwarabi said, and, and, you know, I may be slightly gray. I, I still use that social media stuff. Um, but, but the principles are the same, whether I'm talking to somebody or broadcasting wider or one-to-one -one on social media. Yeah. You know, as Natasha said, you've always got to offer something um, that you hear all sorts of phrases about sharing insight, sharing value or you know, i have a friend who his motto in life is always be adding value and the more you do it what you give you get back in the long run um but you've got to be prepared to invest the time and that's the thing you know it takes time you've got to carve your day out or your evenings or your weekends depends how mad you are to actually invest time in doing these things can i add something here i think some reps find the prospect of like nurturing your network, especially through social media, a little bit overwhelming sometimes. They might see some reps do it really, really well and think, oh God, have I got to be that amazing person that creates all these really funny videos? Like I'm not that person. I can't do that. And so I think my advice would be like, start small. It's really easy to find great curated content that other people have posted that you can share, you can tag people in that you know would be interested in it. And then always be yourself. Don't try and be the funny person posting videos if that's not you or the person sharing all the data if that's not what you care about. You have to be yourself when it comes to social and when it comes to building networks. And so that would be where I would start if you're thinking about how to do that and where to begin. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's such a good point and, and, and one which uh, people just need to take small steps on, I think, to, to start and to build a little bit of... Little, build a little bit of confidence. I've been posting consistently for a year and I've had uh, next, next to no traction. So you can't be, uh, can't, <laughs> can't, can't be doing worse than me. Um, just uh, one which keeps, keeps coming up in all the conversations that we're, um, that we're having uh, is just about uh, emails and, and, and opening, uh, open rates and, and, and subject lines. Uh, and I think one of the things that I've been conscious to be drawn into is the fact that 
it's really difficult to give you prescribed subject lines on something like this when how could we personalize them but it's come up so often i just wanted to get your your views as a panel on uh, on these kinds of things again natasha i'm sure you've got like endless uh, amounts of data on on this kind of thing so maybe start with you and, and then go to the other guys yeah for sure so i have a, a couple of things to share with you guys here when it comes to emails and subject lines that contain either covid or coronavirus we're seeing a 40 percent decrease in open rates across the platform <clears throat> and so again i think that kind of goes back to my point earlier that it's an easy thing to fall back on everyone's using it and everyone's using it to really spam the market so how can you be different other things to look out for. So I've got some particular words that aren't helping your case and some particular words that really are. So interestingly, when subject lines contain the words remotely, help or together, they are considerably lower in their reply rates. But when they contain things like hope or coaching or partnership or interestingly, checking in, meeting for direct asks or call for direct asks, that we're seeing a huge increase in responses. So a couple of things for you guys to think about when it comes to the way you're um, phrasing your subject line, shall we say. So it'll be interesting for someone to try and personalize, but then include something like helping uh, in, the, um, exactly. in, 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 in the subject yep. line. And, and just for um, anyone that doesn't know the, the kind of sales loft uh, story, I assume that's from a substantial amount of data. That's, yeah. I mean, <laughs> exactly. So we ran a ton of data that went through the platform uh, in the couple of weeks around, I think it was maybe a week or two ago, uh, when things had really hit home and we've just compared it to same time previous year so that we get a really good comparison across all of the emails that go through our platform. Yeah. And it's millions and millions. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, it's, 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 it's in the millions, right? I, just to add to that, I love that. I've, I've written down those key words of help, checking and coaching. That's obviously getting the best outcomes. Um, I, I do obviously a lot of split testing. So uh, one of my big niches is, is real estate, uh, estate agents in the UK and real estate everywhere else. And, and I've got probably 25,000 records of estate agents. So when I do a email campaign, I, I normally split into the four and just split test which subject line gets the best open. And it's interesting. The one that's always got for me the best response is this we've mystery shopped you would you like the results and it's quite interesting because the way i work with my clients is i i do generally mystery shop them probably not all twenty five thousand, but some so i've got some insight so therefore i'm getting value uh, and i've got value to talk about when they finally come back but for, for all the email campaigns i've ever run that's by far you know been head and shoulders above everything else and, and I, I don't really know what, I guess it's curiosity, but I guess also it's I'm giving something first. I'm going to share some ideas that will help their business, you know, for no cost. And then obviously hope to create an opportunity on the back of it. Natasha, you seem like you wanted to jump in there. Thanks, Tony. I was just going to say, yeah, I think it, it's probably also because it's different. I think where people get... Um, maybe a little bit bored of opening emails is where the subject lines just say the same thing every time. And so I always find it's the reps that come up with kind of crazy, weird and wonderful little subject lines that just really work for them. But it's because either you're adding value, you're catching their attention, or you're just saying something different to what every other person is saying in their inbox. And that would, of course, make me um, open my email as well. So. And Tony, the view is that you've done some research in a general sense. And then once someone has opened, you'll, you'll share, we've mystery shopped your industry and this is the data rather than. Well, I, I, it's, it's a, is I, it a fabrication? Like what's a... <laughs> quite clever, actually. Well, I think it's quite clever what we came up with. So we, we do obviously a couple, you know, probably four or five. So we've got an idea. But what we do is we qualify when I get an inquiry on the back of it. And the last one I did, we got, we went to 25,000 and we got just over 130 inquiries. And my, my telesales team then phone them and qualify them or disqualify them, as in we're not the right fit for them. Right? And I think they made about um, something along the lines of 30 appointments, Zoom appointments. And then what I did prior to the appointment is mystery call them all. So I, I phoned all 30 myself and with yeah. my mystery call team. Um, and then I've got genuine insights to share. So I funneled it down that way. Yeah. Um, and, and I think Tasha's made a really good point about creativity. So I've got an accountancy client that was looking, you know, for biz dev. And we, we worked on who their niche was. 
we did a we bought the data we did a and then we did an email campaign but i i said what, what are you looking to achieve and they said that we just want the email opened so i'm not saying i don't know the legalities of this but the subject line i, I came up with for them was hmrc investigation and when the prospect opened it it said dear john if you use my services you'll never get an email like this and you know what it caught it got traction a couple of people were pissed off and said i almost had a heart attack but overall <laughs> overall it got some people said that's genius loved it but it got traction i think that's the point you've got to be different people want and sometimes marmite is good right sometimes controversy you, you've got to be a bit different from now i believe I, th I think important things to take from that are that um, your objective of the subject line is to get an open and then maybe your first line is to get to the second line and then and then and then through it um, again uh, the creativity is really important and I think you should just be able to provide a good anchor for everyone there that just if you're thinking about like how do I um, stand out and is it is is it too risky to send something like this those couple of examples probably show you that it's okay, <laughs> which uh, which should help for everyone here to feel um, to, to feel a little bit more more confident. Mark, I only, been, I only got arrested once, you know, so <laughs> that gives you some reassurance. <laughs> Mark, did you have anything to add on the on on the topic? I, I'm just going to add cultural appropriate appropriately. You know, understand your audience. Uh, yep. We do a lot of work in the states, and some of the emails that they send out, which work in the states don't work here and some of the things that work here don't work in the states so it all comes back to know the persona you're targeting how they're going to react um that's you yeah. know and and do a little bit of a, a self-test you know um i'm probably a little bit more not that it looks conservative than tony you know but be be clear you know because again for each of the you know all of you on the call that email reflects your corporate culture your corporate message so it has to be in line with that. The Maverick is the one who sends the Tony email if you're representing HPE. You may get them as an individual the result, but if I'm the um, Chief Revenue Officer, that may not be the message I want to get. <laughs> yep. So that, that's all I know. Not that there's anything wrong with what Tony does, because it works for Tony. And that's, you know, right. Sits with his personality. Sits with what he's trying to do as a business. And could i just ask uh, i'm very conscious of the time one minute left just for each of you do you feel like with emails you're looking for a response or do you see it as a tee up for then a later later conversation but yeah, are you, do you want people to reply currently teeing up for a later activity so yep. we share an insight and then i have uh, someone who follows them up so what's important i know who's opened it and if i've got something they're going to download that I've tracked that they've actually downloaded it and preferably opened it. Yep. So that then gives us the right to speak, but we're not looking for, when we're doing it, I'm not looking for a lead per se, sure. I'm giving something for people to ring up. A hundred percent agree. And there's always an outcome I'm striving for, you know? Um, so I use BombBomb platform. So I do a lot of v video emails go out with a personalized message. And, and for 50 of my prospects, I actually created this, which is a video business card. So they got that in the post with a video that played with my books there. So it's again, and that got an amazing ROI. You know, I, I sent 50 out, um, which cost me about 750 pounds and I won three clients who spent over a hundred grand with me. So in terms of ROI, it was phenomenal. Um, but it, again, it's, it's it marks spot on. You've got to know your avatar, the persona of who you're targeting and make sure the message is absolutely on point. Yep. And for you, Natasha, what do you what do you typically see with with customers using like sales loft as a as a case? Yeah, tool? I'd say two different things. The the first is it, it depends on where you're at in the in the process. Uh, I think for for most part, if the customers are going after a hot lead for the very first time, we're always going to ask for something in every single email. But you have to recognise that for the most part, you aren't going to get an answer from the first one. So you have to be adding value. You have to be teeing up for for other interactions throughout that sales process. And then we change tact. So once you've gone after somebody for a certain amount of time and you think, do you know what? I want to focus elsewhere, but I still want to nurture these people. That's then when we are giving, giving, giving and not necessarily asking. And we might change tact as we sense that maybe it is the right time to buy or they are starting to engage now. And then that would be when we would ask for something. For sure. Excellent. Um, 
we are one minute over. Uh, let me just say that key things that I took from this uh, were the preparation is key. Uh, put yourself in the buyer's shoes and, and how you can actually actually help them. Uh, and some, um, I think some really good advice there on the, on the email front. Um, and I know for a lot of you, that's an area where you'd be looking to upskill yourself uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, let, me, let me remind you of uh, the email addresses which have been shared. Uh, please get in touch with the panel. Uh, to the panel, thank you very much for, um, uh, for, your, for your time and input today. It's been, uh, it's been incredible. One of the best ones we've had so far. Uh, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you very Thanks, much. Guys. Thanks, guys. Thank all. you, everyone. Bye now. Bye. 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 Bye.